about glycolysis and then the fate of pyruvate at the end of glycolysis, okay? And so it may have occurred to you guys that if making lactic acid has some positives, right? But it also has some pretty significant drawbacks in that we make lactic acid, again, chemistry, I know you guys hate chemistry, but an acid in water dissociates, so you get lactate and hydrogen ions, and those hydrogen ions basically screw everything else up, okay? So you may be wondering, well, if that is a thing that happens, why on earth would it be useful or reasonable to ever make lactic acid, right? Like if it's only going to cause problems, right? A little bit of short-term gain for an eventual sort of problem, right? Then why should we do this? It's a good question, okay? But I'm going to illustrate... Um, a little bit here at the very start about why potentially it is somewhat useful, okay? And metabolically, you also have to remember that I don't know how to phrase this in, the, in a polite and other sort of non-whatever way. We have to think about, regardless of sort of how people think about these things, we have to think about this from an evolutionary standpoint. And way back in the day, right, we, we not always lived like this, where a reasonable number of people had a reasonable amount of food that is available and all of these things. And, you know, we're, we were not in danger of being eaten by the velociraptor or a saber tooth tiger or something in that way. OK, and so we need to be able to supply a lot of energy really, really quickly in an effort to be able to flee or climb a tree or something in that way. All right, so you got to think about it in that way. And so what we're going to start off talking about today is this, this molecule here called NAD, okay, which is an electron carrier. And so we talked on Wednesday about as we oxidize glucose down, right, we make some, we put some ATP in, we make some ATP back. On the back end, we net some extra ATP, more so than we get from creatine phosphate and those things. We ignored this part on Wednesday. We're going to talk about it today, okay? Because one, it's useful in glycolysis, but two, these are also going to become really, really important when we get into aerobic metabolism and talking about the electron transport. Okay? So, still missed. Why is there a mosquito in here? But here, as we break these things down, when we oxidize things, you break them apart. And one of the things that happens as we break things apart is there are electrons, right? If you guys remember your chemistry that are in those outer sort of clouds or rings or however you want to think about it, that are only weakly attracted and only weakly held by those protons in the nucleus. So they're relatively easy if they walk by something else that has a really strong positive charge. They're like, cool, I'll go this way. Okay, this is fine. And so what happens is as we break these things down, we're going to strip some electrons off of all of this. And those electrons are going to get attached onto these electron carriers. As that happens, as the electrons move, then hydrogens which are in essence just a proton, are gonna follow, okay? And so we call this, what happens here, this is what's termed a reduction reaction. We are reducing or we are adding negative charges to NAD, which has a strong positive charge, okay? And so as we move this down, all right, we grab these electrons. You may be thinking, this is great, Dr. Black, but why, why is this important? Well, it's possible that the fate of these electrons could be move into the mitochondria and go to the electron transport chain and use these electrons to make even more ATP. Okay? But another possible fate of these is going to be if pyruvate goes to lactic acid, 
we're actually going to take the electrons from here and we're going to give them back. And that frees up this NADH, turns it back into NAD, which will allow that carrier to come back up here and grab more electrons. So one of the, one of the useful pieces of turning pyruvate into lactic acid is it turns NADH and we donate the electrons back and it frees this back up to NAD, which allows this entire process of glycolysis to continue, okay? If we do not have any electron carriers available in our cytoplasm, then we get to here and we get stuck and we cannot make any more pyruvate. We cannot make the ATP that we get down here. You guys will note the ATP is made downstream of where we pull the electrons off. So without free molecules of NAD, without these free electron carriers, glycolysis stops. And if glycolysis stops, no energy, no pyruvate to be able to go into, to go into aerobic metabolism, okay? So one of the things, one of the utility, the utilities of making lactic acid is it keeps us having free NAD molecules. Okay. And this will become important probably on Monday when we talk about rate control of everything and why do things get, why do things sometimes in very high intensity exercise get messed up, okay? So there is a second electron carrier, okay, FAD, which doesn't really function cytoplasmically. It's, a, it's an inside the mitochondria one, but it serves the same purpose. Okay? And so most of the most of the kind of important things about these is going to come once we get into the Krebs cycle and once we are going to start pulling off a bunch of electrons in the Krebs cycle to be able to use that to drive the electron transport chain and make a huge amount of energy. But there's some little bit of stuff that's going to be here. Okay. So this is showing when we go from pyruvate or pyruvic acid using the LDH enzyme back to lactic acid, our NADH molecule that we made earlier in glycolysis donates electrons and hydrogens back. You guys don't have to know, okay, the actual organic structure of what's going on here. We're not going to get into all of this. I've blocked out all of the organic chemistry that I took, you know, 25 years ago in the midst of, in the midst of everything. Okay, but you will note that that's the only real difference between pyruvate and lactate is, right, that we've got hydrogens that we put back on in places. Okay, so this is partially why we need this to keep glycolysis going. And so this is why making some lactic acid, this is why you guys having some lactic acid in your, in your cells right now, all the time is important. It allows us to continue this process. Okay. Okay. To that end, I'm going to introduce another concept, okay? It's a concept of something called lactate threshold, okay? To start with, lactate threshold is a metabolic intensity, which means it's a, it's, it's a work rate, okay? It's an exercise work rate. In most of you, it's not walking. It's somewhere sort of north of jogging, okay? Any of you would happen to come over to the huff yesterday and see me trying to jog. I was jogging and I was probably over lactate threshold because I'm old and out of shape, which is a whole separate problem. Okay. But what lactate threshold defines? Okay. Remember, there's some glycolysis, there's some lactate production going on all the time in your muscle cells. So if I do a little finger prick and I get a drop of blood and then I measure lactate in your blood, every one of you will have some lactate in your blood right now, even as you're sitting there, okay? So we've defined it here, right? The onset of lactate in the blood, that's really not correct. And so I should strike this out. What I really wanna say is that lactate threshold is 
the metabolic intensity or the exercise work rate at which lactate production increases over what you have in your blood at rest, okay? Over what you have at rest. You all have some amount in your blood right now. Let's just say it's two, and we measured in millimoles, it's two millimoles. For most of you, if you start walking and we do a finger stick while you're walking, it's still going to be two millimoles. You start jogging, it's still going to be two millimoles. But there will be a jogging speed at which it will not be two millimoles, it will now be two and a half or three. And what this indicates, basically, is it's a metabolic intensity where we're beginning to drive more and more pyruvate over to lactic acid. Okay? It's a metabolic intensity where anaerobic metabolism is beginning to have to contribute a greater and greater amount to our overall energy production. Okay? Lactate threshold strongly predicts the onset of fatigue or task failure because once you clear lactate threshold, we begin to accumulate hydrogen ions pH becomes acidic and falls, and force production at some point is going to have to stop. Okay. One of the best indicators of who is going to win an endurance race, think five kilometers, 10 kilometers, half marathon, marathon, ultra marathon because you're a psychopath, triathlon because you're a real psychopath or something, okay? Maybe that, yeah, I think it would be psychopath, not a sociopath um, on those things. Good for those people. Is whoever can run or bike or swim at the fastest speed or at the highest power output, right at or right below their lactate threshold, that's going to indicate you can maintain that work output for a very long time because aerobic metabolism can provide the vast majority of the energy. And so you're not going to essentially do this. Now, I will tell you guys, it's more complicated than that. There's some other things that are going on, but that's the general piece of this, okay? So there's also a good part of being over lactate threshold, and it's something called the lactate shuttle. You make lactic acid, it dissociates into lactate and hydrogen. The hydrogen causes us problems, but the lactate, go back one slide. Lactate's just a three carbon molecule, looks a whole lot like pyruvate, right? We can take the lactate. Once the hydrogens dissociate, we take the lactate and we just stick it in the Krebs cycle and we break it down and we make energy, okay? There are some organisms that only function on lactate. That's, their, that's the carbon molecule that they break down to make energy and those things. And so we call this the lactate shuttle. You make it, it gets into your blood, and then other tissues will absorb that lactate, bring it in, and then break it down and make energy from it, okay? And so lactate is not the problem, it's the hydrogen that's the problem. Here is a graph showing blood lactate level. Break your finger, get a drop of blood, measure lactate in it. And then here is power output on an exercise bike. This is those crappy old Monarch bikes you guys had to road when you did the YMCA thing in Principles of Health and Fitness, okay? We're at 100 watts, we're at 200 watts, and you'll note like we're going up, ping, 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 ping. Lactate's not really changing, and then it begins to go up like this, okay? This last work rate before it increases over resting levels, that is our lactate threshold. Okay, that's our lactate threshold. We'll talk more about this when we talk about fatigue um, after our next test. Okay. Um, I'm going to say this now mostly because um, we've got enough stuff to go on. Okay. Don't worry about. So, this is trying to illustrate the lactate shuttle. Don't worry about these things called MCT1 and MCT4, okay? 
NCT stand for monocarboxylate transferase. These are just enzymes <coughs> that exist in the membranes of different muscle fibers and different tissues, and they're the things that grab the lactate. All I want you to know about the lactate shuttle is you can make lactate in a muscle, it gets into your blood, and it's taken up by a different tissue and then broken down for energy. That's all that I want you to know. Okay. That's what we that's what we've got from there. Okay. We're feeling all right about glycolysis, right? Glucose goes in. We, we break it down to pyruvate. And then that pyruvate either gets turned into lactic, lactic acid or the pyruvate is going to go into the mitochondria. All right. Once it goes into the mitochondria, then we can do aerobic metabolism. Now, I should mention now, and we'll cover it probably Monday, that the pathways of aerobic metabolism can also break down fat, and they can also, if we really, really need to, they can break down protein. The pathway is basically the same. What happens in the mitochondria is basically the same. We just stick carbon molecules into the Krebs cycle, okay? So that part's the same. It's just the amount of times that it goes to Krebs that's going to be the same, okay? Aerobic metabolism is the predominant or sort of largest ATP-producing pathway in your body, okay? The largest one. This is the main ATP pathway. This pathway is called aerobic because it requires a constant supply of oxygen. Okay? Constant supply of oxygen. We will get into after the next test, sort of the ins and outs of, are you ever really without oxygen? Okay, is oxygen ever really limiting as a factor? Um, and, and for the most part, it's probably not, okay? Primarily, aerobic metabolism will break down carbohydrates or glucose and lipid tissue or fat. Okay. It can break down protein, but it's mostly going to be glucose and fat. The great thing about aerobic metabolism is it doesn't make any byproducts that lead to fatigue. And so because of that, its capacity to make energy is essentially unlimited. As long as we have oxygen, as long as we have glucose or fat to stick in there, it'll just run indefinitely, okay? It will run indefinitely. That's the good part. The less good part as it relates to exercise is that it's slow, okay? It's slow. The primary drawback of aerobic metabolism is that it's slow. That's not a problem at reps for you guys, right? You're not doing things. Energy demand is not that high. Aerobic metabolism can provide all your energy at rest. As you sit there, you're fine. But as you need more and more, there may be high enough energy demands during exercise that aerobic metabolism is too slow to provide all of what you need right now at this moment. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so that's going to cause some problems. That's going to lead to fatigue. This is the primary place where people that are, that are in different states of aerobic metabolic training, some people are better. If you're better aerobically trained, you've got a higher or a faster maximal rate of aerobic metabolism, okay? So that's gonna be the, the thing. Okay, this essentially occurs in the mitochondria in three phases or steps, and I'm a dope and I did not go back and change this because I wrote it wrong, but the first step is sort of this transition step. We're gonna take pyruvate and we're not gonna make actyl-CoA, it's going to be acetyl-CoA. CoA is a coenzyme. Don't worry about it. Just know what it is. Okay. 
Acetyl has two carbons. So we're going to go from pyruvate with three carbons, turn it into an acetyl or a two carbon molecule, and hook coenzyme A onto it. Pardon? It's a great question. Where do you think the other carbon goes? Gets released as carbon dioxide. Perfect. Gets released as carbon dioxide. Right? The end product or one of the end products of aerobic metabolism is water and CO2. In this first step, we're going to make some CO2. We're going to make some more CO2 through the Krebs cycle. We make some CO2. Then that acetyl group goes into the Krebs cycle. We spin round and round and round in the Krebs cycle like the square dancing or something. My grandparents were big square dancers. And we make CO2, we make some energy, we steal some electrons, and then those electrons eventually make it to something called the electron transport chain. And we create some gradients, we move some hydrogen, and then we run an enzyme and we make ATP, okay? That's what's going to happen. So those are going to be our steps. So we'll walk through each of those steps. Okay. Here's the Krebs cycle. You should all say, thank you, Dr. Black, for not making us memorize every one of the molecules in here and all of the, all of the enzymes that drive every one of them. Here is, here's the transition step at the very top. Here's pyruvate, okay? This is pyruvate that has come in from the cytoplasm. It's gone into the mitochondria. Here's pyruvate. We're going to pull a carbon off and make CO2. Okay. That remaining two carbon acetyl molecule gets hooked on to coenzyme A. And as that carbon gets pulled off, we grab some electrons, put them onto NAD, and we make an ADH. Okay. And we make an ADH. The same thing happens if we were breaking down fat. We steal two carbons off of, say, some sort of fat molecule and hook them onto coenzyme A. So two carbons at a time come off the of fats. We stick them in as an acetyl group, hook it to coenzyme. The CoA just helps us, right? It's like a crossing guard. It just helps us get into the Krebs cycle. Acetyl gets hooked onto oxaloacetate. Oxaloacetate has four carbons. <laughs> Could not matter at this point. And we make something called citrate, which has six carbons, which I always find to be hilarious, right? Glucose started with six carbons. And now here we are back to a six carbon thing. Why didn't we just stick the glucose in here? I don't know. It doesn't make any sense to me. Um, you know, mitochondria used to be single celled organisms of their own. They have their own DNA. Do you guys know that? Your mitochondria have their own genes. You get them from your mother. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of what's happening. So for whatever reason, this is how this process goes. Six carbons. So then six here, it spins around and we end up with four. So we are going to lose two carbons. They make more CO2. Okay. As it goes around, basically every step, we're pulling electrons off. We actually make some ATP down here. Okay. Most of those electrons go on to NAD. A few here go on to FAD. Ping, 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 ping. And we come back and this just goes around and around. Okay, and that's how the Krebs cycle works. You don't have to memorize how many NAD molecules get reduced to NADH. You don't have to memorize that you get one molecule of GTP, which gets converted to ATP at the end. I'm not going to make you know all of the nuts and bolts. That's what Google is for. Okay, but I just need you to appreciate pyruvate in. Acetyl-CoA, we lose a carbon, we make a six-carbon molecule, we spin around, we make CO2, we grab some electrons. Okay? Simple enough. But it's slow. The key thing is it's slow because there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, <laughs> ten steps. Okay? That pyruvate molecule has already gone through all the steps of glycolysis. Now we've got 10 more steps here. Then we're going to have to take all of these electrons and do some things with them. So it's slow. Okay? It's slow. 
Well, all of this is happening. You've already used all of your creatine phosphate. Right? One step and done. One step and done. Okay. Okay. Feel like we did this. I'm highlighting where you're grabbing some things. You don't have to know this enzyme, but I'm putting a, a box around it because we mentioned it earlier. Okay, there's this enzyme here called succinate dehydrogenase or SDH. This enzyme used to be one of the things that people would measure when they would take a muscle biopsy and look at fiber types and things like that um, back in the old days. So if you ever see things, SDH concentration or activity used to tell us things about how well aerobically trained you are. There's more SDH in type one fibers. There's more SDH in people that are highly trained. They run a lot, they bike a lot, they swim a lot than people like me that don't, okay? That's where we are. Okay. So we've gone through Krebs. We've made a little bit of ATP, but the big thing is we gathered all of these electrons, gathered up all of these electrons. Now those electrons are going to migrate to what's called the electron transport chain. Okay. So far, what we've been doing is all the way down in the very middle of the mitochondria, in the mitochondrial matrix. Okay, that's where the Krebs cycle is. Once we start making and reducing those NADH molecules and FADH molecules, they are going to sort of migrate up by chance to the inner membrane of the mitochondria. You guys remember, a I probably should have put that on here, but mitochondria, okay, has two membranes, an outer membrane, right? And then this is the inner membrane. And in the very middle here, this is the matrix, right? So Krebs is going on in here, and then the electron transport chain all of its components are all spread out through that inner membrane there, okay? So what happens is the electron transport chain is primarily composed of something called cytochromes, okay? Called cytochromes. Cytochromes have iron in them. They have iron. Anybody remember? I said there would not be any more chemistry I like. Does anybody remember from chemistry what's the charge on iron? I think it's two plus, is it three? I think it's two, three. Thank you. Or two or three, depending on yeah. So iron is very, very strongly positive in charge. Okay. And so because the cytochromes have iron, they really want to grab some electrons. And so what happens is as those electron carriers come into contact or close proximity of our cytochromes, they will pull the electrons off of NADH and FADH. Okay. And then the electrons will get passed from one cytochrome to the next, to the next, to the next. As that happens, right, you take the electrons. As they move, the hydrogens are left there. The electrons move. We pump hydrogens across the membrane, create this big hydrogen concentration gradient, and then we get to the very end and we open up a thing, the hydrogens move back, and that drives an enzyme called ATP synthase. Okay. And the ATP synthase enzyme, this is where we make all of our ATP. Right now, all of this is going on in pretty much every cell in your body. Okay. As this happens, maybe I should just show the picture of it here. Okay. Cytochrome. Okay. Rep cycle down here inside inner membrane. Cytochrome, give up electrons, pass electrons, pass electrons, so we get down here, pump hydrogen out, let it in here at the ATP synthase, this thing spins, and we make ATP. Okay, that's how all of this works. Mm -hmm. That's how this is gonna work. Now, if you do the math, We make two and a half ATP per NADH molecule that enters or that donates its electrons. You cannot make a half of an ATP. So what that means is that sometimes we make two and sometimes we make three. Okay? And next month, they'll change their mind again. 
the amount that we make from this has changed like five times since I was in y'all's place and all of that. And all of that does is it changes the total amount that we make, 37 or 39 or 41 ATP, if we fully break down a glucose molecule, right? The big instance is you make a bunch, okay? We make about two and a half per NADH, one and a half per FADH, because the FADH gives up its electrons in a different cytochrome, and that's so we make a little bit less, okay? Now, where we use oxygen is right here at the very, very end. Okay? Oxygen is here. We've moved all of these electrons, and they get to the, to the last cytochrome, and then we got to do something with them. And those electrons then are going to be grabbed by oxygen, and then we're going to grab these hydrogens that are getting pumped back in, and we're going to put hydrogen and oxygen and electrons together and make water. So like everything else, if there's no oxygen, there's nowhere for these electrons to go. So the whole process shuts off. Okay. So the whole process shuts off. That's why oxygen is important. Oxygen is called the final electron acceptor. Okay. The final electron acceptor. And that's how this works. Okay. So we've made ATP, we've made water, and we've made CO2. All right. This is a cartoon trying to depict, right, the carbons, but also kind of the three-dimensional kind of togetherness of all of these processes, like I drew on the board on Wednesday, right? Here's glucose and glycolysis going on out of the cytosol of the muscle fiber. You've made our pyruvates. That pyruvate's then going to get into the mitochondria. Here we are making acetyl-CoA. We've lost the carbon. Krebs cycle, spin, 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 right? Electrons, electrons here in the transport chain make ATP. We then take that ATP from in the mitochondria and we shuttle it out. And then there it is for, for it to be used in the cell. Okay. All right. I also like this um, cartoon because it shows essentially glucose and glycolysis and then what happens in aerobic metabolism. And then you can see that what we're getting is potentially protein, fats from adipose tissue, glucose either from the blood or glucose from, say, liver glycogen that's going to be here and how all of this is working together. Okay. In your body right now, every bit of this, except for maybe the amino acid part, it's always happening, okay? You're always breaking down some carbohydrate. You're always breaking down some fat, okay? As you use blood glucose, you break down glycogen in your liver to match the blood glucose, okay? Who hasn't had breakfast? You might not have breakfast. Those of you that haven't had breakfast, you're breaking down way more liver glycogen than those of us that did, okay? And this is just this balance that we have that's going on. But all of it gets fed into the same, the same system, okay? And that's how all of this works together. Okay, same thing. You can just do some math. You're not responsible for knowing all of this. Okay. We will start, we'll probably finish this in our next like four minutes, but we'll start talking about just the adipose tissue side of this, okay? So what we have here is aerobic metabolism, but rather than using glucose to pyruvate as our initial substrate, we're using fat. And we're going to use a triglyceride molecule that has come out of our adipose tissue or a triglyceride molecule that has come from, let's just say, that chicken biscuit that you had for breakfast this morning, okay? You take a triglyceride, we store stuff in adipose tissue as triglycer triglycerides. We, we undergo a process called lipolysis, which is where we break down adipose tissue. You make a molecule of glycerol. You make these free fatty acids. These things dump into the bloodstream, okay? 
these things dump into the bloodstream. And so from the bloodstream, we can take this, put it into a cell, we can begin to break down our free fatty acids. You also have phospholipids that we could break down for energy, but they're mostly in our membranes and things. And we don't want to do that. And then we have cholesterol as well that we can break down. But primarily, when we break down fat and use fat for energy, it's going to be from something that originated as a triglyceride. Okay. We are not going to go through all of the steps of this process. Okay. The process is sometimes, depends on what book you read, but it's sometimes referred to as beta oxidation. Breaking down a fat is sometimes called beta oxidation. Okay. In other instances, beta oxidation is considered to be one particular step in this entire process. I was taught the whole process was called beta oxidation. If you read newer textbooks, it's going to say, no, actually, beta oxidation is just one step down here at the very, very end. It's the process of getting um, of getting the free fatty acids into the mitochondria. It really, really doesn't matter. But you have free fatty acids either in your blood from food that you ate or very likely from adipose tissue that when you're in a caloric deficit, you break down that adipose tissue. Okay. Or you go and you exercise, and you, as we'll see in about a month, you release epinephrine and norepinephrine and growth hormone and testosterone and glucagon, and it actually tells your adipose tissue, start breaking down. Give us these free fatty acids. But they make it into the blood, they get taken into a muscle cell, and then they're in the cytoplasm of the muscle cell, and we transport those free fatty acids into the mitochondria, and then we just start peeling off two carbons at a time to go into the Krebs cycle. Okay? Because a free fatty acid molecule has 14, 16, 18 carbons on it, rather than the six that a glucose molecule starts with, you make way more acetyl groups. It goes through Krebs way more times. So we make way more energy from a, from a, a free fatty acid. Use it at rest. I'm sorry? Is that why we use it at rest? Is that why we use it at rest? <laughs> Ask me that to start a class on Monday. Yes and no. Okay. That's all, you guys. Have a good weekend. We'll see you on Monday. Make good choices.